Hi, everyone. Um, good evening. It's a great to have all of you present. People are still kind of trickling in um, to the webinar, so um, I'm going to start things off kind of slowly. But um, it's a real pleasure to have you here for our uh, first uh, Pathways to Purpose lecture series of the spring semester and of the year 2021. Uh, my name is David Henriksen, and I serve as director of the Institute for Leadership and Service at Valparaiso University. And one of the best things that I get to do as director is uh, invite out interesting, smart, and thoughtful people to campus, usually, to speak in this uh, Pathways to Purpose series. Uh, the series is designed to spark conversations about the virtues and vocations that make for lives worth living. Tonight, uh, as is the case for this entire academic year, uh, we aren't able to have our, our guest physically present, although I do hope we can have her back to uh, Valparaiso at some point in the future. Um, but even virtually, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce my friend uh, Tish Harrison Warren, our speaker for tonight. Um, Warren is a priest in the Anglican Church in North America. She's the author of Liturgy of the Ordinary, Sacred Practices in Everyday Life, which was Christianity Today's 2018 Book of the Year. Her second book, the topic of tonight's talk, is Prayer in the Night for Those Who Work, Watch, or Weep. Um, so you can go, go all order that right now. I think there was a bit of a snafu at Amazon for the first few days of the book release, but I think there, there are copies to purchase now. Is that right, Tish? Yes, uh, it's all fixed. So uh, you go order it right now. I think you actually may have put Jeff Bezos out of a job. I just saw he stepped down as CEO today. I know, I joked. I was like, my book was the final straw. That was it. I think mean, that's what did it. Um, so Tish has worked in ministry settings for over a decade as a campus minister in university, graduate of faculty ministries as an associate rector with uh, addicts and those in poverty through various churches and nonprofit organizations and most recently as a writer in residence at Church of the Ascension in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, she is now a monthly columnist with Christianity Today and her articles and essays have appeared in places like the New York Times, Religion News Service and Comet Magazine. Uh, she's a founding member of the Pelican Project and a senior fellow with the Trinity Forum. Um, before I turn things officially over to Tish, I wanted to briefly sketch uh, the agenda for tonight. So those of you who have come to these talks in the past know the drill. Uh, for those of you who are new, here's how we're going to proceed. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Tish is going to share with us for about a half hour or so, and then we were going to open things up for about 15 minutes of Q&A. Um, hopefully by now everybody is intimately familiar with the technology uh, of Zoom. Um, if, you, if you've done this before, you'll know that there's a little really handy uh, Q and A function. So if you, as long as you have your Zoom window open wide enough, you should see down there on the bar a Q and A button. That is how uh, I will be fielding questions um, for Tish for the Q and A period. So I will receive those via the text feature on the Q and A button, and then I will uh, pose those questions to Tish. So if you just want to list your name, some of you may be logged in anonymously, but if you want to list your name and where you're from, either your hometown or your institution, um, I can just identify you and then uh, pose your question to Tish. Um, if uh, for some reason the Q&A function is not working, um, I will put an email address in the chat feature just so you can all see it. And that email address as the backup to submit questions will be lead, that is L-E-A-D dot serve at valpo.edu. So I think that's enough for the formality. So I'm going to turn this over uh, to Tish. Um, so welcome officially, virtually to Northwest Indiana. It's cold and frigid. I'm sure it is the same in Pittsburgh, but uh, sorry we can't have you here, but it's great to have you virtually for this talk. Yeah, well, thank you guys so much for having me. Um, it's great to be here. I wish I could be with you to see faces and to talk to people. Um, I, I miss, I actually, I really miss um, being able to connect with folks, uh, but we're doing the best we can in the middle of, um, a global pandemic, and um, I appreciate your time. Uh, any extra time on Zoom feels like a gift uh, right now to me because I know that people are Zoom exhausted. So um, I'm going to talk about my book, Prayer in the Night. Um, so I began this book after a hard year. Um, uh, the year was 2017 could not have imagined a COVID pandemic at that time. Um, but it was a hard year. Uh, 
that I had moved in the January I began, um, I began a new job in Pittsburgh and I moved from Austin, Texas, where I am from, to um, Pittsburgh in the middle of January. And um, a week after I arrived, my father back in Texas suddenly passed away. And um, I had a ticket home for his birthday, a plane ticket to go see him and ended up using that ticket for, to go speak at his funeral. Um, the day after his funeral, we found out that I was pregnant, which was something we were really wanting. And my husband and I were very excited about. Three weeks later, we uh, had a miscarriage, which I, that's sort of where the book picks up. Um, so if you get prayer in the night, the, the um, story that starts the book begins with that miscarriage. And then um, we ended up pregnant again, um, kind of shockingly, and um, had a long, hard pregnancy. And then second trimester lost our son. Um, so it was about six months that were just hard. And um, I was in a place at the end of it of just being kind of exhausted. Um, so the suffering that I experienced that year is not unheard of. The book is certainly not about catastrophic suffering or, or really um, extraordinary types of suffering. Uh, in many ways, what I experienced was ordinary suffering that um, many folks go through, the loss of a, of, um, a parent, certainly miscarriage is unfortunately one in four pregnancies and then miscarriage, move, a sense of loneliness, um, and uh, all in all, um, I have had a pretty average life, pretty average suffering with a lot of privilege and a lot of blessing. And um, yet, even in the middle of this sort of ordinary suffering, this year um, brought up kind of these churning questions about how to continue in the way of Jesus in the midst of pain and in the midst of darkness. Specifically, I struggled with knowing how to pray. I felt like um, there were so many unanswered and unanswerable questions to ask of God. But I also was aware in new ways of um, the reality, and it, in the words of my former pastor, Hunter, that you cannot trust God to keep bad things from happening to you. And of course, I always knew this. This is self-evident in some ways. But, um, but I think um, spiritual exhaustion and um, the sorrow of that year brought that question or brought that reality up in a new way. And so I asked, if that's the case, if you can't trust God to keep bad things from happening to you, how does one trust God at all? And I wrote that question as I was writing this book and I didn't have an answer. I walked away from the screen. I walked away from my computer um, because I didn't know. I didn't have an answer. If you can't trust God to keep bad things from happening to you, how can you trust God? How can you trust that God is good? How can you trust that God is for us? So to be clear at this point, I had finished seminary. I was ordained. I had um, written on this. I could certainly kind of give a theological answer, um, but it was just that that answer had become deeply unsatisfying. And the question I was asking is what theologians and philosophers call theodicy. It's a lot, the logical dilemma of how God can be good and all powerful even as horrible things regularly happen in the world. And it also names, the concept of theodicy also names something um, more profound than just a question to kind of you know, keep theologians in business. It uh, often represents a crisis of faith that comes with an encounter with suffering. Theodicy 
isn't just kind of a cold philosophical conundrum or theological question. It's, it can become, and it often is, an engine that drives our doubt. It um, can sometimes wither belief altogether. A recent survey um, by Barna showed that um, the most commonly stated reason for unbelief, for um, disinterest in the Christian faith from millennials and Gen Zers, people in Gen Z, was um, that they have a hard time believing that a good God would allow so much evil and suffering in the world. So this is something that is acutely felt and increasingly felt by younger folks, by the younger generations. So in the book, I, I talk about how ultimately theodicy is not like some cosmic algebra equation where we can just sort of solve for X. It's uh, almost a primordial scream. It's this sort of ache at, at the base of what it means to be human. It's a protest from the depths of the human heart where we're saying, where are you, God? Is anyone watching out for us? Why this evil in the world? Why heartbreak? Why allow suffering? So in this book, I talk about theodicy as an existential wrestling match between, on one hand, the reality of our vulnerability and all of the um, deep sense of kind of quaking um, weakness and fear and mortality that that holds. So the reality of our vulnerability in one hand and the hope, the deep longing for a God that can be trusted in the other. And the tension between that is what I'm sort of trying to call forth with when I talk about theodicy. So at the end of the day, I think we don't ultimately want an, just an answer for the problem of evil or the problem of suffering or theodicy. We want action on the part of God. We want God to set things right. But in the meantime, we wait. God has not set things right yet. We live in the already and not yet. And this meantime, which is difficult and uncomfortable to live in, the problem of evil is in the words of Flannery O'Connor, not simply a problem to be solved, but a mystery to be endured. We wait, we endure. So how do we continue to endure this mystery? How do we continue to walk in the tension of holding with complete honesty, human vulnerability and the hope of God, a God of goodness? So, I want to talk about some ways that the church responds to this that I think are less than helpful. One way that we can respond to the mystery of, of theodicy or the mystery of pain, the problem of pain, is um, that the church can sometimes minimize darkness. Um, however subtly, however unintentionally, um, we can sort of try to downplay darkness to defend the reputation of God by being overly chipper, <laughs> by um, kind of baptizing optimism. Um, and often the heart of this is, is not bad. It's trying to focus on goodness, trying to focus on the resurrection. But by ignoring the power of death, we end up inevitably belittling the resurrection by trying to sidestep some of these thornier questions, we end up belittling um, hope, the hope we have in Jesus. And we end up with a Christianity that has trite answers, that, has, um, that gives pat answers to people's pain, that has shallow responses to the brokenness in the world. And, um, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but some of the most inane and kind of cruelly sentimental things that um, I've heard have been at funerals that we can sort of um, end up engaging in, in, in almost a cruel kind of sentimentality, um, trying to downplay the reality of darkness and evil in the world. 
and sadness in the world. Another unhelpful way the church can handle this is to adopt a subtle or sometimes not so subtle um, prosperity gospel where we lead people to believe that if you have enough faith or if you do the right thing or if you're moral, if you kind of hold up your end of um, the religious equation of things, that things will go well for you, that um, God will be on your side, that you can avoid the darkness by being devoted enough or holy enough. Um, and ultimately, we know this isn't true. And so um, we, this kind of falls apart and and which is ultimately in part why people leave the faith because it's, it's this, um, we know that, that it's kind of selling something. We know that it's not real. Um, we know this because we, we know people who have prayed, who have been faithful and who things still haven't gone well. Things didn't work out. So we don't have a pat answer. We don't have a solution. We don't have um, an easy equation for the problem of theodicy, but we have a story. So my friend Julie, um, who I bring up in the book, had she um, and and her husband, their son, when he was about one years old, had to um, had to have surgery, and so as they were wheeling him into the OR. And they were saying, you know, goodbye to their baby son, having no idea how the surgery would turn out. Julie turned to uh, her husband and she said to him, we have to decide right now, before we know the results of the surgery, if God is good. Because if we wait on the results of the surgery to determine that, answer by the results of the surgery. We will always keep God on trial. So how does she decide, right? She couldn't base her decision about whether or not God is trustworthy or good on what happened to her son. Or I would, the total amount of good in the world versus kind of the total amount of evil in the world. Um, if we look to that, to determine the character of God, the evidence is frankly inconclusive. Uh, Francis Spufford writes, we don't have an argument that solves the problem of the cruel world, but we have a story. And the catechism of the Catholic church says there's not a single aspect of the Christian message that is not in part an answer to the question of evil. So we're given the story, we're given this whole story of creation, fall, redemption, consummation, and all of it is necessary. All of it is in part an answer to the question of evil. So my friend, Julie, back to the sitting outside the operation room of their sweet infant son, had to decide if she trusted God when she didn't know if bad things would happen to her or her son when she didn't know the result of the surgery. But it wasn't a decision that was just a leap in the dark. It wasn't something that was just um, kind of wishful thinking. And it wasn't arbitrary. She didn't look to the evidence of all the good in the world versus all the evil in the world or what happened to her son, but she looked to the evidence of the life of Jesus. She looked to the story of the Christian life. The church has always had to endure this mystery of theodicy. This is nothing new, of course. And we are not the first generation to notice this tension, right? In, in the scriptures or in, in um, the story itself. But the church has left this chord kind of humming in dissonance. Let this continue to be a, a tension that is unresolved in the Christian faith because it proclaims that only God can sound the final consonant note. That it is God himself 
God, God self that can work um, to bring this tension to harmony. So our trust that God is good is not that God, you know, keeps all bad things from happening or that God takes away our human vulnerability, but that he entered into it in the person of Christ. Divinity has entered into the fullness of human vulnerability in actual history. And because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, we believe that ultimately death and, and the power of death will be defeated. So we look to the story to ground our endurance in this mystery. But that said, we can't just sort of cognitively hold this story in our head as a brute fact, because when we're in very deep grief or in deep times of doubt, brute facts are often too cold to be able to capture our imaginations and our hearts and to bring comfort that we really need in these times. The story we live by is one that we somehow must enter into. We discover our smaller stories within the greater story of God and his church. And we do that through practices and through prayers that we receive from those who've gone before us. So um, one of the analogies that I use to discuss this is the idea of cairns. Um, I don't know if there's any hikers out there, but um, I hike a lot. And um, uh, my husband, Jonathan and I hiked Mount Washington in New Hampshire. And it's known for this like, crazy weather. It can go from sunny to like a snowstorm in a matter of hours. And um, hikers have gotten lost and um, died on the mountain because um, the weather changes so quickly. And there's this deep fog that settles in the mountain and you can't see um, very well. And so what the folks of um, New Hampshire have done, have built these giant, giant cairns, these huge rock piles. So when you can't see anything else, there's these huge piles of rocks. Um, and if you go from cairn, to, they're close enough together that if you just, you can see one from the other. And if you just go from cairn to cairn to cairn, even in the worst weather or deepest fog, you make it to the shelter on top or the shelter on bottom. Um, so I talk about the prayers and practices of the church in my book as cairns that have kept me in the way of Jesus, that when I could not see, um, when the fog was deep and thick, there were, there were these practices that I could go from place to place, from cairn to cairn, that kind of kept me in the way um, that kept me in the way of Jesus, that kept me um, walking toward shelter, even when nothing seemed certain. So when I couldn't pray, it, the church said, here's a cairn. Here is words that you can pray. Here are prayers. When I couldn't believe, the church said, come to the table and be fed. Here's a cairn. Walk from here to there. And when I couldn't worship, the church sang over me in the language of faith. These inherited ways of prayer and worship, these practices of our faith, are a way that the ancient church built cairns for us to endure this mystery, to continue to guide us home. So I want to highlight three of these um, cairns uh, that I discuss in my book, three of these practices that that help us to endure a mystery. And um, as I say, these practices don't make this like tidy or happy, like living in the already not yet is often an uncomfortable place to live. And this doesn't change that. Um, but these are these are practices that have continued to help me walk in deeper and deeper into the story that I believe. Um, these are practices that have taught me to be able to say, I believe, help my unbelief 
and to continue through these practices to say, to pray, I believe, help my unbelief. So um, I get these practices, the ones that I'm going to discuss tonight, not all of them in the book, but um, well, I guess all of them from the book come from this meditation on um, a prayer, a keep watch dear Lord prayer, which is um, a prayer that I sort of build the book around. Each chapter is a meditation on one um, phrase of that prayer. And it's a prayer that I um, have taken from the prayer practice called Compline, which is night prayer, which it's almost nine o'clock here. So this is very appropriate for this time. Um, and it's from uh, the Book of Common Prayer. So Anglican um, night prayer became really important to me in 2017. And so I take one particular prayer from that service and, um, and I sort of structure the book around that. And the prayer begins, keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep. So over the years of praying this prayer, those three postures, working, watching, and weeping, began to be something like a lattice around um, which grew my imagination uh, about Christians' response, kind of our posture in response to the darkness in the world. So I'll begin um, tonight, as I begin with my book, with the idea of weeping. So grief is an ingredient in all of our lives. Maybe we particularly feel that this year in um, 2020 and 2021, but this will not be the last year that we know grief. I used to think of grief as kind of the private property of a certain um, group of people who had particularly difficult lives, um, who experienced particular, particularly intense trauma or, um, or struggle, or I thought of grief as a response to a particular season of our life that was difficult. But I have come to see grief as um, a part of all of our ordinary lives. Um, that grief, in fact, is a very true response. It tells us something true about the world. Um, it's a true response to a world that is both good and fallen. And in this sense, grief speaks theological truth. It tells us about reality. So the process of mourning is therefore a Christian practice. A point I make in the book is how quickly we can kind of skip over grief. And um, Christians can even, as a friend of mine um, has used this language, uh, had, he used it in a review, actually in my book, that we can cork um, our grief with theology itself sometimes. Um, we can kind of use that to sort of try to sidestep grief. But Jesus, who we... Um, follow, who we, claim, who we want to be like, um, was one who wept. And if we are to be like him, we have to learn to be people who make time and space for grief. One way to take up the Christ, this particular Christian practice is through lament. Um, lament, which has been talked about a lot more this year than uh, I have heard in the past. Remember, I wrote this book in 2018, so I had no idea how relevant it would be to this year. Lament is um, in part holding God to God's own promises. In particular, when we feel our experiences don't conform to those promises. And the um, one of the best ways for us to intentionally enter into lament is to recite both corporately and individually psalms. The most common form of psalm is psalms of lament. And, but the psalms that are, especially if you enter into kind of a daily reading of the psalms or um, a very frequent at least reading of the psalms, you'll find that um, they represent the massive array of human emotion. Um, John Calvin said the Psalms show us 
this is a quote, the anatomy of all parts of the soul, um, which I think Calvin did a good job with that turn of phrase. Um, the Psalms open up to us the anatomy of all parts of the soul. They were, um, the Psalms were the first prayer book, the first recited prayers of the church. So in taking up these prayers, the church learns to be alive to every possible emotion, to joy, but also to sorrow, to faith and trust, but also to doubt, to anger and frustration, um, to, to celebration. The Psalms dare us to speak to God bluntly, to even use sharp words. And yet the Psalms also challenge us when we approach God simply like an unhappy customer, right? And I talk in um, the analogy I use in the book is, is how does lament not just become like a bad Yelp review for the creator of the universe? The Psalms shape our emotional life. So they, they teach us to voice our um, deepest, darkest uh, thoughts and doubts and um, anger and questions. But um, as Todd Billing says, we bring our anger and our fear and our grief before God in order that we may be seen by God. Todd Billings, by the way, is a theologian who also is dealing with terminal cancer, um, has incurable cancer. So he says, we bring anger, fear, and grief before God in order that we may be seen by God. And being seen by God leads to transformation. Jesus himself praised the Psalms more than any other part of the Hebrew scriptures. The Psalms are, are almost constantly on his lips. And um, Psalm 22, of course, is a lament Psalm that Jesus prays on the cross, right? It's some of his final words on earth, he reaches for the Psalms. Psalm 22 is a Psalm of deep agony talks about our bones being out of joint, our skin melting like wax. It's an intense psalm. But the psalm shows us how to hold together this kind of searing pain, this doubt, this um, sense of being forsaken by God, and yet trust in God. Because the end of the psalm kind of turns and begins to confess this true story of the world. It's, it, it, um, the psalmist says, in the assembly, I will praise you. After all of this, the psalms form us into this people who can hold sorrow really honestly, but also hold to the promises of God. And they teach us to grieve. They teach us to weep. And I have way more to say about that. I have a whole chapter, but for the sake of time, I need to move on. So we begin with weep, weeping, we grieve, but we also watch. So um, the next chapter in the book that I talk about is the practice of watching, of waiting. We keep a magnet on our fridge. I could have brought it up actually, it's right downstairs. Um, but it says, everything will be okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. And we just bought the magnet in a little gift store in Chattanooga. Um, so I don't think the magnet is intending on purpose to express Christian eschatology, but it is, whether it wants to or not. It's pointing to this hope for the final resolution of all things. Um, for the moment that as Julian of Norwich famously says, all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. So this, is, this does not mean that we should pretend that things are well now, but it does mean that ultimately our hope, Christian hope, is an eschatological one. It's waiting, it's watching for Jesus to set all things right. We watch in the words of the creed, we watch for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. But, and this is key, we also believe that God's kingdom, the life of the world to come, is not just sort of in the distance chronologically, but is, is crashing into reality now. 
so that God is at work even today. So through prayer, we take up this practice of watching for God at work. Rowan Williams talks about how prayer is like bird watching. Um, I'm not a bird watcher, but he is. And he talks about how prayer can be like bird watching, that it teaches us to sit still and to wait for something extraordinary, something out of our control to burst into view. He says, this is a quote, that living in this sort of expectancy, living in awareness, your eyes sufficiently open is basic to discipleship. So we watch, we watch for God's coming kingdom. One way, this looks a lot of different ways. We could talk about a lot of different ways that waiting and watching looks. One way that this looks in my own life, that particularly this looks in my own life um, in times of grief or sorrow, when that becomes more intense, uh, when grief and sorrow become more intense, is, um, is watching for glory or um, pleasure through beauty. So in 2017, when things uh, were particularly hard, I found this almost insatiable need for natural beauty um, and for art to be reminded of God's continued beauty, continued work in the world, um, even as I was experiencing darkness in my own life. As a church, we gather each week to watch together for the eschaton, to watch together for Jesus to make all things new. But we also watch for the evidence of God's work, for the evidence of the kingdom coming in our daily life and in our daily community. So we weep, but we also watch. We watch for goodness, for beauty, for truth, which leads us to this final practice, which is work. So we don't just kind of passively watch for the kingdom to come. Through our own labor, we participate in God's work. We take up participation in the work of God as a practice even. We can bring light into darkness. Um, so there's a powerful tendency in our culture that, that once you start seeing it, you'll see it everywhere that I um, name in my book as um, competitive agency. This idea that work is either God or us and never kind of both together. Um, that, and oftentimes goodness then is then assigned to sort of human agency, um, what we're doing. And then implicitly you kind of um, go to God for blame or, um, but other times, I guess, uh, particularly in the church, it can it can lead to that work is all gods, and that we um, are somehow are kind of passive players in that. An example in general of competitive agency would be um, in the response to the COVID pandemic. Andrew Cuomo, governor of New York, said, and this is a quote: "Our behavior has stopped the spread of the virus. God did not stop the spread of the virus." So if it was our behavior, then it's not God and vice versa. And you can see this even among Christians that we just trust God, we trust God to stop um, this virus. And then therefore our behavior could be downplayed or, or have very little to do with that. And so, um, but competitive agency is, is ultimately not the way Christians are to understand work that, um, and again, this is all over our culture. So it's somewhat countercultural to conceive of work this way, but we proclaim that God is already at work, even as we join God in that very work. Ephesians, of course, talks about um, that we're created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. God is already at work and out of that abundance, we join in the work. So it's not either God at work or us at work. It's not in competition with each other, but it's both together. So we work to alleviate injustice, to seek and build the common good um, because we are joining God 
in his work of justice, in his work of bringing light, in his work of the common good. We're, we're co-laborers together with God in the reconciliation of um, God to creation and, um, and ourselves and society with one another and ourselves with God. So we can do this in um, kind of through small acts of kindness, through caring for those who are suffering, through volunteering at a homeless shelter, um, through um, showing up at church and dropping off, you know, a casserole to someone who's grieving. We do this in community by caring for those who are suffering. But we also seek to do this through our vocations, right? Through our jobs. Um, and of course that could be unpaid vocations like mothering and fathering, but also through um, seeking to alleviate suffering through medicine or through good governance, through good politics, through a just society, seeking a just society. Um, and we push back darkness, we participate, we're co-laborers with God in creating beauty by being writers or artists or stand-up comedians or fashion designers or musicians. So we work and we watch and we weep. But I also lastly just want to point out that it's key that we hold to all these dispositions together, all of these kind of postures or practices together, both individually but also as a church. Um, so as we respond to the brokenness of the world, we, we grieve, right? We weep. But if we grieve alone and we stop there, we can fall into despair or fall into cynicism about the world and either believe that nothing will ever change. And so we throw up our hands or we kind of simply try to live lives as comfortable as possible to avoid grief. Um, so if we grieve and we, and we grieve alone, kind of we get paralyzed by that. And so we grieve, but we must also watch for God at work to set all things right, to change things, to improve things, to um, bring his kingdom, both at the end of all things, but also now, today, in um, the ways that God is at work in our midst. So we're grieving, but we're also watching. But if, if we only watch, we could end up with having a really passive response to suffering in the world. And we see this kind of passivity um, sometimes in fundamentalist or, or conservative, very conservative Christian circles that kind of um, would say, you know, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. And so let's just sit back and wait for Jesus to come back or wait for the rapture or whatever. Um, and it takes a very kind of passive response to um, the brokenness of the world, waiting for Jesus to come. But, um, but that produces that waiting and watching is not an anticipatory, a participatory, anticipatory and participatory um, waiting. It's a, it's a um, passive position. Or we can sort of... Um, watch in a way that um, that kind of is saccharine um, and sentimental and we kind of belittle the brokenness of the world. We focus on beauty and goodness while, while belittling or um, giving or sort of uh, papering over the darkness. So we need grief but we also need watching but we also um, work and join God in his work but if we go to work, if we, if we only work, which can sometimes be um, certain kind of activists, particularly like an Amer Americans and American evangelicals, we're like go-getters. So if we go straight to work without the work of grief, without watching for God at work and watching for the com coming kingdom, our work can become compulsive. Our work can become ungrounded. Um, it can actually become a way of avoiding dealing with pain or complexity or sorrow in the world. And if, if we go to work like this compulsively, we inevitably 
um, can't be honest about the way that our work itself is limited, that we will not be able to drive out all darkness in the world on our own. Um, and we are not honest, therefore, about the ways that our work itself can be complicit in the darkness, that, um, that we can be complicit in the darkness and in systems of injustice and brokenness. So um, realizing our own limitations and the ways that work is um, participates in suffering. I mean, I, I do think that um, some of the ways that we experience grief is in frustration over our work, and frustration over the limits of our work, um, the thorns and the thistles, as, as scripture talks about. Um, so that that draws us back into grief, right? And, and to weeping and to watching and to working. And so there's this kind of cyclical relationship between the three that we hold these postures together. Ultimately, where we see weeping and watching and working come together is the cross, right? It's the, a place where um, in the cross, Jesus wept over the darkness, over the brokenness of the world. He grieved his own um, sense of forsakenness and suffering. He lamented through the Psalms, but he also watched for the coming kingdom that he was bringing through his own labor, through his own work. It is because in the cross and in his life, in his incarnation, that Jesus entered into, it's because God himself entered into this vulnerability that we can then meet God in our own vulnerability. In some way, God beat us there. He beat us to the experience of vulnerability. So these practices um, ultimately are not just kind of like good things to do. There are ways of entering into the life of God. There are ways that God meets us in darkness where we can even be sort of surprised by God in darkness. And there are a way that we continue to endure this mystery. We continue on this path with the cairns that the church has left for us. This was a way that I have continued to walk um, through weeping, through watching, through working, even in darkness I've experienced in my life and will continue to walk in this way, I hope all the way home all the way up the mountain or down. So that is an overview of my book. Are there any questions? Okay. Well, thank you so much, Tish, for sharing with us. Um, yes, so this is the time we're gonna transition um, to a period of Q&A. So hopefully folks have uh, found uh, the Q&A button down on the bar, at the bottom of the Zoom. Um, feel free to just type in your questions there. Um, and then I'll be able to see those and relay those to Tish. Um, while those, those Q and A's are being um, stockpiled, I'll take the, uh, uh, use my privilege as the moderator to maybe pose the first question, Tish. Yeah. That's right. And I wanna say one other thing that was sort of, I kind of touched on a few things in the first few chapters, but that it wasn't, I said it was an overview, but I actually, there was quite a bit in the second, there's four parts of the book and it really just kind of covered the second part. So um, if you have questions, if you've read the book and have questions about other parts, feel free to ask about them. Um, if not, you can read the book. You can yeah. send me questions. So my question for you um, has to do with um, how one processes grief. And, and you turn specifically, as you, you talked a little bit about tonight and at more detail in your book, to the specific prayer in the, the Anglican Episcopal tradition called Compline. Um, but I wanna ask you like, did you, what was your first instinct when you were grieving? Like, was it immediately to turn to these ancient cairns, these ancient prayers, or did you, as I think you, you said elsewhere, turn to Netflix and greasy burgers? Like, what was yeah. the thing that you turned to initially? And, and why do you think that something like Compline is, is such a useful thing to help you actually move beyond the initial stages of grief? Yeah, so, um... I really feel like I was not very well equipped to know how to respond to grief. Um, and so my tendency 
was, um, and sometimes still is just through habit and practice, I have learned to, um, to just numb out, to avoid grief, to numb. Um, and for me, that looks like, that looks like uh, this part of the reason this is called prayer in the night. And part of the reason that this book centers on Compline is because, um, nighttime was particularly a difficult time for me. I could get busy during the day um, and sort of fill up my day with work and um, activity. And then in these dark hours, in these nighttime hours, um, the empty time, the um, sense of even, I think, physical vulnerability from nighttime would, would open up these questions. Night kind of amplified my sense of loneliness, anxiety, fear, sadness, grief, loss. And so I would fill it up. I would um, doom scroll, the kids call doom scrolling. Um, where you just, and this was 2017. Uh, my father, My father actually passed away on the same day that Donald Trump was inaugurated. So um, I completely missed the inauguration because of um, my grief of my father. But um, if you recall, there was a lot of political commentary in that time. And I, I read all of it. I just consumed, consumed. Um, uh, that would um, watch Netflix, would just sort of do anything to kind of like distract. Um, and I had a counselor, I went, I went to a counselor in this time who, and she kind of challenged me to sit in the night, to kind of sit without distraction, to let the questions come. And, um, and she, you know, she, she said, get a glass of wine or a cup of tea and journal or take a, like, take a bath and hey, like it was, in other words, it wasn't like she said, you need to sit and pray. Um, I could sort of um, she just was challenging me not to go to distraction, um, just to have some quiet at night. And I couldn't do it. I could not have, it was like, I was, a I could not have quiet at night. I was afraid or I responded really, um, I just rejected any kind of silence. And so, um, so I filled that time up with like numbing agents of any sort and distraction of any sort. And, um, so the way, and as I said, like prayer became very difficult for me. Um, I think for some of the same reasons that it opened up those questions, it opened up a sense of grief. And so, um, so eventually I, because I had nighttime was so difficult and prayer was so difficult. I had um, prayed Compline on and off for years as an Anglican priest and, um, and had gone to, there was a Catholic church down the street from me um, when we lived in Texas that had this beautiful sung Compline service. And so I kind of went back to that and started praying Compline because I, again, like I felt like I could not pray. And there were these words that I didn't have to drum up, that I didn't have to perform. I could just sort of fall on them, um, particularly at nighttime which when, when it was difficult for me. And it allowed this kind of space for me to sit with the questions. And Compline in particular did because Compline is full of um, struggle. I mean, it's full of uh, acknowledgement of the perils and dangers of this night. I, um, I think I told you this, that I had was trying to listen to this kind of Christian Bible study guy. Um, and it was fine, but it was so chipper and so victory in Jesus. And it was like, just, uh, I was just like, ugh, like this is just not what, it just felt um, far too kind of shiny um, for me at the time. And um, I needed a way of prayer that really acknowledged mortality, sickness, vulnerability, and um, Compline is kind of rung round with the death. You know, we, we, it um, talks about mortality. It, you say, oh, awake, uh, may we watch with Christ and asleep, may we rest in peace. It talks about perils and dangers. Um, 
And so I needed, I needed that sort of um, recognition of vulnerability in prayer. And so um, this was kind of my way back into silence and way back into prayer um, because my first response was not that. I mean, my first response was just to absolutely run from the loss that I felt, from the sadness that I felt. And I mean this in that I didn't want to feel bad feelings. I mean, it was that simple. Um, I don't want to over psychologize that. It was like there were bad feelings and I was trying not to feel them. Um, and also, though, I mean, uh, all the questions and all of the um, struggle with God. I was new at a church. I was, um, I was, it was a, I was not necessarily new to ministry, but I was new to this church. And, um, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of a um, problem when your priest has a hard time praying. That's like a, not something you're looking for in, um, in a pastor. And so um, every impulse in me was to just run from all of this. And um, Compline kind of opened up space for me to sit with God in this, in these questions I had in the, in the sense of loss. Right, we do have a couple questions coming in. Uh, the first one it doesn't have a name attached to it, but the question is, how do we respond to people who try to compare levels of suffering or seek to dismiss their own or someone else's suffering because it could be worse? Yeah. So I talk about this um, in my chapter on grief because could be worse was like a mantra of our house. I mean, I really felt like I couldn't grieve unless um, if anyone had it kind of rougher. I mean, I, I do think that there's a, a really valid place to acknowledge and name our privilege, right? That um, I, don't, I don't think that it does well to kind of exaggerate or um, overemphasize, overemphasize our, our grief. Um, yet, I also think there can be a real dark side to that of, um, of trying to, it, I think we can belittle our own suffering um, because if anybody has it worse, um, we feel we don't have permission to grieve. Um, so uh, I talk about that fairly extensively in my book. Um, but I think we all have to get sort of comfortable with the grief that each of us has in our own life. I don't mean comfortable in the sense that we're okay with it, but get comfortable with the reality that we each have grief in our life. Um, some of the people who I've seen who are very best at this are folks in the recovery community. Um, there, there's, um, because addiction is such a response often to grief, um, it's easy to sort of say, well, you know, that person had an abusive childhood and I didn't or that. And constantly what I hear from folks in recovery is like, don't, do not compare our grief. There's a great scene actually in um, Jeff Tweedy, the, from, the guy from Wilco has a memoir and has a, um, more or less said this when he was in recovery and um, someone got in his face and was like, you need to own your grief. Like don't compare your stuff to our stuff. And um, and I, I do think that that's kind of, a, that's a healthier way to respond to grief. I think there's a culture though that we're creating of belittling other people's grief. We um, do that through kind of first world problems, right? That was like a hashtag for a while. Um, or um, uh, I, I think I think the idea of privilege is very real, but I think we can we can use that to sort of invalidate um, the grief of folks that are privileged. What I am not saying is that everybody's grief is the same. I'm not saying that everyone suffers the same amount. That is self evidently clear that that's not true. I mean, there are folks that just have it worse than other folks, but I I think that. Um, even though there are first world problems and um, there's still, there's still problems, there's still grief. And so I, I think that, that, that we need to kind of, I think um, in order to be people that are emotionally alive, in order to lament well, we need to um, 
resist the cultural tendency of belittling grief of other people or ourselves um, because there's something deeply human um, that binds us together in the fact that we're all people that carry grief. We're all people that carry burdens. Um, so it binds, it allows us to see and to have compassion on one another, um, to understand that we're each carrying grief. But it also, um, grief is a, a chief place that we encounter God. And so if we constantly belittle our own grief, we're actually missing moments of discipleship. We're missing places that God would meet us in our ordinary, maybe average suffering. Um, and so um, I think it's okay to, I, I don't think we should try to kind of prove our grief to other people that uh, particularly those who aren't compassionate. Um, but I do think we should be curious in, in your own life and the moments in your life that you feel grief, be curious about it, be curious about where it's coming from, be curious of, about where it might lead you, where God might encounter us in that and leave space and openness um, for that, whatever that looks like, journaling, silence, prayer, talking to a friend. Um, I hope, I don't know, I hope that answered the question somewhat. Uh, we have a few more rolling in. We're, we're running out of time. So I'm gonna see if we can get through maybe, maybe a couple more. Um, this one comes from Jana Ritgers. She asked, you talk a lot about your individual response to grief and suffering. Can you talk about the role your faith community played in your grief and how the church can respond to the suffering individuals may be experiencing? Yeah, so I, I do talk about that more in the book, um, but uh, then I probably did in this talk, but I think all of these practices that I talk about, we do in community. So weeping, we do in community. I mean through, of course, through like rituals, but I actually think, I think funeral rituals can be like kind of a terrible time to grieve. I mean, just the way that we do practices of this in the church can sort of, um, not, not necessarily in the church, but in, in parts of Western culture um, are real buttoned up, kind of real um, put together. And so, but I do think through um, some services of lament, I think that's really important for the church to recover through silence, through the Psalms. Um, I think we need to learn together to weep, to, to weep with one another. Um, uh, I think watching um, is something of course that we do together I mean, the Eucharist is the ultimate picture of kind of weeping and watching coming and working, coming together in our gathered liturgy. Um, but it also, our work is um, caring for our community. And so um, I I don't know, I'm, I know I tell the story in the book, but I can't remember where, but folks really showed up for us. I mean, it, in the process of, of our loss, um, folks would come with food or brought, I mean, I remember these college students, sweet, sweet college students from our church showed up with this huge box of art supplies for my children. Um, and so part of um, the work that we do together is caring for those. Um, and like I said, some of, the, some of this looks like big stuff, right? passing laws that bring justice. But I also mean just caring for the people around us that are hurting. Um, and so each of these practices we do collectively, both in our liturgy, our gathered liturgy on Sunday, like we need to leave room for limit. We need to leave room for weeping. We need to leave more silence, honestly, in the service. Um, but also, through the life, the life of the church together, through caring for one another in that, in this sort of life on life way that we show up for one another in hospitals and, um, and walk with each other through a life of brokenness. And um, through, a, I have a chapter on affliction where I talk about what does it look like for the church to continue to walk with people when it's not a short-term crisis, when it's going to be a long road of, of pain. 
Um, and I actually think the church could really grow in that. Um, but I think that that is the calling um, that we have. Okay, I think um, I'll leave it to you whether you want to answer one or two more. I'll, I'll give you one more and then uh, depending uh, how you feel, we can, we can wrap it up. Okay. Um, this one also comes from somebody who doesn't attach a name, um, but I think it's the flip side to the question that you just answered. So this question, I'm going to paraphrase it because it's a bit long, but um, the question is about individuals whose suffering comes from the church uh -huh. as opposed to how the church could be a source of support. What if the church is itself the thing which is inflicting some of the trauma and the, the suffering on the person? Yeah. Um, so the question is, um, the natural impulse, they say, is to disengage, to try and get away from the painful thing. So do you have any recommendations on how to get through that temptation and still be Christian on the other end of it? Yeah. Well, that's a really great question. Um, it's difficult because I feel like I would almost need to know more about the specific situation in this. And this is what I mean, is that um, there are times if, they, if there's hurt that's coming from a particular church because of unhealth or toxicity or um, I think that word is overused, but, uh, but um, something kind of malformed about the church itself. There are, there are times when um, through community and with, I think it, it really helps to have mentors and spiritual directors um, in this decision. It, you, you need to leave a church, um, a particular church a local church that, or, or whatever, where this hurt is coming from. Um, but, and, and some folks will not like this answer because, um, yeah, it's somewhat of a controversial answer, but I'll say in my own life, when I've experienced pretty significant hurt from a church in particular, um, and eventually really under the direction of my bishop um, left that church, um, where I, I went, I was just broken, um, going to, uh, I was showing up to this other church, um, during this and I, church was a hard place to be then. And I came, um, and I, I just told the pastor, I'm not going to get involved. I'm just, I just need to heal. Like I need a way station. And I would show up each week and take the Eucharist and just weep. Um, and, but in that church, in that way station, I found there was healing. There was healing in the community. There was healing through uh, the receiving of the word, through the receiving of the sacraments. And um, so ironically, I, the hurt I experienced in the church, I found healing in the church, um, not the same church, a different church, but in the sort of global wider church. Um, so the question is, yeah, so it's harder if I, I don't know um, kind of how broad this particular church hurt is that this person is speaking about. Um, but um, man, I mean, you will be hurt by the church, like anyone, if you're around it long enough. Um, and Flannery O'Connor again said, we suffer as much sometimes from the church as for it. And the only thing she says that makes it tolerable um, is that this is the body of Christ. And it's true. Um, if, you, if you are around the church long enough, you'll be hurt by people in it. Um, and so, um, it's difficult to talk about this because there are instances of like true abuse in the church. And that's gonna, that I, I don't, I mean, that you need to get out of that situation, but also um, that's gonna take a lot of, a lot of time, a lot of counseling, a lot of, um, so I'm not just saying if, if you've experienced some deep, deep um, wound of abuse, that uh, just to you know, pick up the next Sunday and find a new church. I, I understand that, um, but there's also a lot of hurt that wouldn't fall under the category of abuse um, that we sort of all have experienced and will experience by the brokenness in this 
in this kind of institution. Um, and yet I think um, that the church is the body of Christ and that we are called to her. Um, and so I think uh, this is part of the, the brokenness we bear in the world, just, just as all of us are hurt by our families um, and yet we continue in them. I think this is part of what it means um, to be a Christian is to continue um, with the people of God. But that said, that there's a lot of different local churches and, um, and sometimes it's time to leave one. Um, maybe time for one more question. You can make it as brief of an answer as you like. Um, but this is a COVID question. I was wondering if we would get one of these. Um, so this comes from uh, Lisa Woodward. She says, uh, you spoke about the importance of not staying in isolation in your grief. So I'm wondering in this year when so many things are deferred, what will happen to those who are experiencing profound grief in the present that must defer yeah. that kind of human closeness and restorative community? Yeah. Will this be mended in the future or is it imperative to seek out the grieving in their isolation right now? Yeah. I do think we need to seek out the grieving in the ways we can. I recognize that that is um, limited in times of COVID, but I, I mean, I'm convinced that some of the political polarization we see in society now um, is, is a response to grief. Um, there's kind of the COVID has been sort of a mass trauma uh, disrupting a lot of our lives. Um, I, the last, as I've been doing interviews on, on the book have heard horrible statistics of, um, of since uh, March of last year when we kind of went into lockdown, um, some pastors in Mississippi told me um, that it's, the state of Mississippi said there's a, it is the most alcohol that has been consumed in Mississippi in recorded history has been this year. Um, teen suicide is on the rise sharply in states. Um, we're seeing kind of uh, the second wave of COVID is we're, we're going to see kind of huge like mental health consequences of, of the sort of isolation that this pandemic has um, has brought that, that we sort of had to walk into this, but there's these, these huge secondary um, issues that are coming from it. I really think that some of what we see of folks being drawn so much to conspiracy theories is this response to fear and anxiety and grief in the world, that when things seem deeply isolated, when things seem uncertain, that um, some of these conspiracy theories provide a sense of community and connection with other people that people were longing for and a sense of meaning um, and explanation for the brokenness in the world that um, that was evident right that it, it it was a false sense of meaning it was a false explanation but it was something to attach to to give meaning to the seemingly random chaos of the world and to do so in community um, so I think this question of, of isolation and grief is, is just absolutely having mass ramifications in our culture and um, in, our, in our nation right now. Um, so, what, what, so the question in that, do, how do we respond to the grief in this? I think that um, we, in the ways we can, have to be proactive about reaching out to folks in grief. Um, this has been really, really hard as a pastor. Um, I, I, I think many pastors, this has been their hardest year of ministry um, because we are meant to do, we're meant to care for people in person right? We're meant to be able to put an arm around a grieving person. Um, and a lot of that's been disrupted through COVID. So we need to do that in the ways we can. Um, some of that might open us up to some risk, um, but there has to be a balance between kind of mental health needs and grief needs, and also the need to keep people safe. 
um, from, from disease, from COVID. Um, but I do think some of this is just, I mean, it is a broken world and the pandemic is part of that. And so um, I do think there's gonna be long ramifications of grief in this. Um, so I hope that the church can continue to kind of emotionally shepherd people through this, um, to help people have practices, even as we're separated to enter into their grief, um, to recognize it for um, what it is. So it doesn't morph into outrage or self-destruction um, and, and to learn to, um, for that to be a place of discipleship, for that to be a place of spiritual growth and formation. Um, but in general right now, like how do we reach people? How do we form people when we're all so isolated, when many churches aren't able to gather? It's a big, big question that I don't really have an answer for, but I do think there's going to, there's going to be ramifications for years, for years, um, because of the grief that we are collectively walking through now as a culture. All right. Well, it's a somber note to end on, but we are. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm good. Maybe this is a, it's like a three hour therapy for some of us. So thank you so much just for, for joining us tonight. It's a real pleasure. It's an amazing book. Um, and I mean that sincerely. Um, so folks should go out and, and, buy at least one copy, maybe two, get a copy for a friend. It's also a great Lenten read, I think, uh, as we're approaching that season. Um, so uh, thanks again. Folks will be able to uh, revisit this talk. We'll have a recording up later on if you want to spread the word. Uh, Tish was also a guest on uh, the Call and Character podcast with me uh, on an episode that went up yesterday. So um, there is no way to convey a round of applause, but I'm sure folks are very grateful that you chose to spend your evening with us. Uh, it's now, I'm sure, way past your bedtime, but thank you, Tish, for, for being with us tonight. Yeah, thank you guys for being, for letting me be with you and for being with me. Okay, and we'll bring you back in person sometime. Okay, it's All a right. deal. All right, good night, everyone. <laughs>